now 43, let's finish up our chapter two keynote. So I want to just reemphasize um, our core tiles and how these core tiles break up your data. So if we take a look here, I had an odd number of observations. So you can see my median is right there in the middle, right? We could call that Q2. We could also call this the 50th percentile, right? So half of my data is from here on down, half of my data is from here on up. All right, but what I want to focus on is if we look at Q1, right, if I take the median of the lower half of my data, I get to Q1. If I take the median of the upper half of my data, I get to Q3, right? And it's breaking my, my data into 25% chunks. And what I mean by that is 25% of my data is here, 25% here, 25% here, and 25% here, right? And if I had a normal curve, which we will get to this normal distribution. So let me just, oops, excuse me. Let me try that again. So if we get to this curve, I'll, I'll just write this as this is the normal distribution, a bell curve. All right. And again, our variable would be down here on our x axis, just like it would for any graph. But I want you to see that here from the whatever the min is, right, over to Q1, that is 25% of your data. Right from Q1 to the median, or Q2 if you will, I'll put median here, there's another 25%. There's 25% from median to Q3, and then there is 25% from Q3 to your max. Right? And so I just want you to see that the distances here, right, this chunk of 25% of your data has a larger range than this, this chunk right here, right? This chunk has a smaller range, than this chunk. So I don't want you to think that it has to be evenly distributed, these, these chunks of 25%, where, where up here they were, this was 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, and those distances look to be the same, but you can see there is actually a little bit of a gap here, right? There's no twos, right? So you, you do have a little bit of a gap. So just, just be aware that 25% of your data might spread longer than a different 25%. And Here's our middle 50%, right, between the IQR. Okay, so moving along from there, we also talked about cumulative relative graphs, or I should say cumulative frequency graphs or cumulative relative frequency graphs. Here, and we did this example in our packet, this is a cumulative relative frequency because you see the phrase percentage there. Now, if I asked you on here to find, oops, excuse me, if I asked you to find Oh, third time's a charm. I'm going to keep saying that periodically. If I wanted you to find Q1, the median, and Q3, actually, let's let's even do a little bit more. Let's find the five-number summary just so we can make this happen, right? If I look, I can see there's my min, right? If I go to the 25th percentile, there is Q1, right? If I go to the 50th percentile, there is Q2, and if I go to the 75th percentile, there is Q3, and then there is my max. And if I look at those corresponding heights, it looks like it's 60, this is what, 71, this is 74, and what do we have here, 77, and then 85. So I could actually go ahead and say, hey, this is 60 inches, right? Q1 is always a fourth of the way up the y-axis, so we go to that 25 number, and then we see that there was a corresponding height of 71 inches, the median was 74, Q3 was 77, and then the max was 85. So what I could do if I wanted to is I actually could go make a box plot, right? I could have height in inches here, and if I look, we want to go 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85. So let me go ahead and put these up here. And then I'll go ahead and make my box plot. So we had a mark at 60, a mark at 71, another one at 74, another thing at 77, and something at 85. So I could actually go ahead, if I wanted to, and make a box plot. Yeah, not too terrible for just running through a box plot like that. But that's a cumulative graph. So anytime we have Q1, right, we think of that as the 25th percentile. Right, so we want to go a fourth of the way up our y-axis and see what the corresponding x value was. The median is always equivalent to the 50th percentile, right? and Q3 is always equivalent to the 75th percentile. So I could say that 75% of these basketball players 
are 77 inches tall or shorter, right? Or 77 inches or shorter, right? I could say 25% of the basketball players are 71 inches t- uh, tall or shorter, right? So there's all sorts of sentences you could put together. And you might not have cumulative relative frequency. You might just have frequency along the y-axis, and that's fine. If you did, you could do the same thing. So if I wanted to go through here, this looks like my minimum is around 10. But if I look at this, this y-axis and I wanted to go a fourth of the way up, well, if there's 40 as the highest frequency, well, then a fourth of the way up would just be to 10. And that's where you see me finding my Q1. So whatever this number is, there's Q1. Right, if I want the median, go half of the way up, go to 20. See what the corresponding x value is, right? And whatever that is, and I'm putting it here as you can see 36 and 44, that is my median or Q2. Same deal with third quartile, go three fourths of the way up. See what the corresponding x value is, it was 52 in this case, right? And that is Q3. And so I could also, if I wanted to, you could practice, you could take this information and you could make it into a box plot if you want, and then you could start talking about all sorts of socks. All right, so moving along from there, in terms of resistant versus non-resistant stats, when you hear about something that is resistant in, in a stats class, it means outliers don't affect the data, all right? So what are we resisting in stats? Outliers. So there are two statistics that aren't affected by outliers, and then most of them are. Outliers really do change your data set. So the median and the IQR do not get affected by outliers, and that's because this is the middle number in a data set, and this is the middle 50% oops, percent. That's supposed to be a percent of your data set. And whatever we have anything in the middle, it's not going to get affected by outliers, which are on the outsides, right? They're on the extremes, either the highs or the lows. But every other stat we have, all of these, right? Range, min, max, mode, median, oh, excuse me, mean, <laughs> standard deviation variance, they're all going to get affected by outliers. So typically, if I ever have outliers in a data set, I'll use the median and the IQR. I'll use the median for my measure of center and I'll use the IQR for a measure of spread. And when we're talking about socks, I'm talking about these back two. All right, and then when things are nice and symmetric, or at least roughly symmetric, I can use any of these. All right, okay, so now let's talk about why we need both a measure of center and a measure of spread. So imagine you had two different classes, all right, and we had some exam scores, and I'm gonna ask you which class had more A's. All right, so I want you to see that class A, they had a mean of 70, and a standard deviation of four, and class B had a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of 12. So before I put up the answer, try and think this one out, pause the video if you want, and think which class had students, had more students earning an A. Right, when you're ready, unpause it. Okay, but now I'm gonna, I'm gonna graph the, the scores, oops, excuse me, I'm gonna graph the scores for this first class. So if we're in class A, all right, I want you to imagine students had a score of 70, right? And it says that you had a standard deviation of four. So if I was one standard deviation above the mean, I would be right here at 74, right? If I was two standard deviations above the mean, I'd be here at 78. If I was one below the mean, I'd be at 66. And if I was two below the mean, I would be at 62. Now I want you to imagine I rescaled this. This z-score would be a negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. All right, and we've talked about z-scores, but quite literally, if you're in class A here, right, if you're in that class, oops, let me put two here, and you score 78, you are quite literally two deviations above average, right? Because if average was 70 and you scored 78, you are two standard deviations above the mean. Your z-score would be two, right? And similarly, if you scored 66, right? If you scored 66, you're below the mean, right? You can see it, and you're below by exactly four. All right, so again, I can always rescale any data set to z-scores. All right, but let me erase all of this just so we can start to break this down. Okay, give me a moment, there we go. Now, I want you to hear, and we're gonna talk about this more in chapter six, but most of the time, folks are within two deviations of the mean. All right, so most of the scores in this class were between, 
what do we have, 62 and 78. Now, it doesn't mean that all of the scores were, but most of the scores were between that. Okay, that's fine. If we're talking about A's, it's not really looking like too many students got an A in that class because a lot of folks are between, like I said, 62 and 78. When we get to chapter six, we're actually gonna figure out that 95% of scores were likely in this band, okay? But we're not there yet, so let me erase it. And now let's talk about class B. So imagine I had class B, right? And they had that same average of 70, but they had a standard deviation of 12. So if you scored one deviation above the mean, you would be at 82. And if you scored two deviations above the mean, you would be at 94. And on the flip of that, if you scored one deviation below the mean, you would be at 58. Let me see if I can extend this. And if I subtract another 12, I believe I would have 46 here. Yeah. Now, again, I could rescale this. If we go to z-scores, this is still negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Right? So I can always rescale things to z's, but we'll work on that a little bit more in Chapter 6. And I do want you to see here that if most scores, all right, most scores here were between 46 and 94, I think you can start to hear that we're getting a couple of the A's, right? So that 94 is actually getting us into that A range. So in terms of which class had more A's, we would say class B actually had more A's, right? But on the flip of that, they also had more F's. Right, so they had people going a lot lower than we did in class A. All right, but that's why you need both a measure of center and a measure of spread. So just telling me a class scored 70, okay, that's one piece of information, but I need to know how they were spread out. What, how did they deviate from that mean? All right, now in terms of finding standard deviation, we've got our calculators for that. Right, so once you put your data in your list, you're gonna hit stat calc and you're gonna do option one and you're gonna probably put L1 in there, right? That's usually where we put our data. And then we have to decide, do we use this S or do we use this sigma? All right, so both symbols represent standard deviation, right? This technically represents a statistic and this represents a parameter. All right, and you might say, well, I thought you could only find, find the parameter if you ran the census. I agree, so, oh, there's the actual output. So if you're using your calculator, only use that S line, don't use the sigma. There will be one exception to this rule in chapter four. So I'm just gonna put chapter four will have an exception. And that exception will be in that case, if the S line is blank, that's the only time you'll use the sigma line, okay? All right, so five number summary, all right? We need five statistics to make a box plot. And this was the last major plot we talked about in here. It's the min, Q1, median, Q3, and the max. You need those five numbers, then you can make a box plot. And there are a few types of box plots you can make. You can make a regular old box plot, a modified box plot, or parallel box plots. All right, modified are the ones that we're gonna focus on. Whoops, excuse me. They show outliers. And now that we've talked about how to calculate outliers, I'm always gonna want you to show your outliers if you're making me a box plot. All right, but in terms of box plots, there's your regular old box plot, there's a modified box plot. You can see the outlier hanging out. And then we have parallel box plots. Now, most software writes box plots vertically. So instead of having our x-axis where we normally do, the variables on the y-axis here, Right, and then they have your parallel box plots. Now your calculator does them um, horizontally, but just be aware that the vertical versions are out there. In terms of finding outliers, all right, we're gonna create something called a safety zone. And that's a term that I came up with. Right? It's not any other term or any, it's not official I should say in any other stats book, but I always say, hey, find your safety zone. And the first thing to do is you need to calculate the IQR. Once you do that, whatever number you find in step one, multiply it by 1.5. And it doesn't matter if there's a decimal or a fraction, just multiply it by one and a half. Right? And then take that number, whatever you get in step two, subtract it from Q1, but add it to Q3. Right? So this is gonna create our lower bound of our safety zone. Oops, that's not how you wrote. Let me separate that word. Lower bound of the safety zone. This is gonna create the upper bound, which is great. And that's how we find it. And then quite literally, any data points that are outside of the safety zone are considered our outliers. 
All right, last thing we wanna talk about is shape. So the most common shape adjectives you're gonna give me are skewed right, skewed left, or roughly symmetric. We will pick up approximately normal when we get to chapter six, when we start talking about those z-scores again. So in terms of roughly symmetric, I would say these are all roughly symmetric. And again, this is Google images, right? So I've got this bimodal graph here, right? But it's still, it's roughly symmetric. This is roughly symmetric, roughly symmetric. You might say this is a little skewed, right? But it's also just roughly symmetric. And here we have our bell curves, our approximately normals. And again, I'm going to keep saying they're coming in chapter six. All right. Then we have positively skewed versus negatively skewed. So when I say positively skewed, that's me saying, hey, something is skewed right. And when something's skewed right, that means that the median pretty much stays under the peak. You can see it moved a little bit here, but the mean gets dragged up, right? It gets affected by these high outliers over here or potential outliers over here, all right? And so if you got a skewed right graph, positively skewed, the mean is to the right of the median. And then on the flip of that, let's say you had a skewed left graph or it was negatively skewed. This time the mean gets dragged down by these potential outliers on the low side or at least the lower, the lower values of your variable. Because again, imagine this is your x-axis, right? If this is x, these are the lower numbers, these are the higher numbers. So if you have fewer lower numbers, they're dragging the average down, but the median can resist those. So skewed left, negatively skewed, the mean is to the left of the median. Sometimes it's easier to write it the other way, and it really just depends on what works best for you. So sometimes I would say here the mean is greater than the median, and here I would say the mean is less than the median. But ultimately, it's the mean that is moving. So I want you to see it's always the mean that's moving, all right? The median pretty much stays tight. Okay, so don't forget that whenever I ask you to graph something, you're gonna wanna use your socks, right? And then if you have clusters or gaps, let me know about them, all right? Thanks so much, everyone, bye.